Hey everybody and welcome back. Today we are going to talk about the Satan. These are the star gods of the Necrons. Now the story of the Necrons starts when the Necrons had finished getting spanked in a war by they fought against the Old Ones. The Old Ones were Kermit being frog lookalikes and they decided in their infinite wisdom that they had beaten the brakes off the Necrons quite significantly and the Old Ones wanting to preserve all life consigned the Necrons to their home system planets, as thoroughly smashing the Necrons about the head seemed to be enough. This, however, had the problem that the Necrons slowly started turning on one another. The Necrons, obviously jealous of the Miss Piggy connection and the cheat codes to eternal life that the old ones had, were not going to put up with this. Who knew the Necrons had such a fetish for pork? So that's when the Necrons turned to their last resort an energy organism that they'd known had been feeding on their star for quite a while. And so they designed living metal bodies for these creatures so they could inhabit. Now why, you may ask? Well, because it can eat a star, it may just help us, and be super duper powerful. Now when they met the Satan, they explained about their fetish for pork and eternal life, how good the sun was at ending their lives short and painfully, their internal fighting, their loss at the hands of the old ones, and in general, how a bunch of pathetic losers of a race they really were. The Satan not wanting to kink shame the Necrons, and not totally sure what a pig even was, patted them on the head and struck a deal with them. They could help the Necrons beat the Miss Piggy lovers of Kermitville, assuring the Necrons that they were benevolent, eager to have allies, and they would rule equally with the Necron across the stars in beautiful, happy hugs. This, of course, is what the ignorant and bleeding dogmatic inquisitors of other 40k lore channels will tell you here on YouTube. But that, my friends, is a lie. And not at all what happened. Because in 40k, you need to know all the truths. See, these other YouTubers, they will tell you the Necrons were quote-unquote tricked by the Satan, and that there was a guy named the Deceiver who set up the whole deal, and the Necrons in their desperation made these deals. This all too, of course, is a lie, for all you have to do is take five minutes of insight, or better yet, be like yours truly, and know a few demons of the warp who were around then. You see, the Necrons had known about the Satan for thousands of years. Yes, indeed, they knew these individuals were feasting on their son, and were even incidentally causing their cancer. Two reasons they never tried to get in touch with them. First, they were indirectly killing all the Necrons, so that's not good. So at a bare minimum, they're a pest, not a friend. And secondly, Necrons could still just leave the system at this point, so there was real no need to make deals with them. But after they got defeated by the old ones, now the Necrons had a reason. And when they made contact with the Catan, at first the Necrons were fairly certain that the Catan had no idea about the concepts that the Necrons would need them for. Things like improving their life, their biology, Creatures, even death, pain, and suffering was probably foreign to them. To a creature made of pure energy, these concepts probably didn't mean anything. And all they really understood was feeding. So these Necrons kind of saw the Catan as animals to be domesticated. Now the bodies of the Necrons made for the Catan to inhabit were not bodies purely. They were prisons. See, the Necrons were not about to just give an energy creature of immense power a body to wander around their empire in. Same as you wouldn't bring a rabid bear into your camp just because it's good at killing things. You wouldn't let that just wander around. Nor were the Necrons summoning the Catan to make a deal. The Catan were supposed to inhibit the bodies and be trapped inside it. Being the all-powerful slave to the Necrons, as long as they fed this all-powerful but dim-witted creature, they could tame it to their purposes. And what could be better? But what the Necrons did not count on, and could not have known, is that simply inhabiting a body gave the Catan intellectual perspectives that developed at an alarming rate of understanding. This first Catan to inhabit a body found he could not leave it, and understood it for what it was, but decided to play along. It wasn't that he couldn't burst out of it if he wanted to, but this lesser race intrigued him, and their suffering had a, a sweet flavor to it when he was around it. The energy wasn't like feeding on a star for him. 
that was more of an overall feeling of drawing power and more of a thing that just kind of happened. No, the suffering was intimate. It was visceral. It came in all kinds of notes and flavors. It was like eating a salad bar for your whole life, having the same thing time after time for decades. And then suddenly, you discovered that menu with a thousand different delicacies on it. And you could have whatever you wanted at any time. The first Kitan helped the Necrons like an all-powerful dummy. Improve their machines moderately, their medicine, their structures a little. The Kitan then claimed he was not the smartest of his race and didn't know how to do much else. But there was another named, the Truthbringer. If they could give this Kitan a body, he could really launch the Necrons to another level. So the Necrons finding this Kitan docile and easy to control continued with putting more Kitan into bodies. As the Necrons put more and more of the Kantins in the body, their influence grew more and more among the Necrons, performing miracles, advancing their tech slowly, incrementally along the way, never letting it get too far ahead of where the Kitans wanted it, and even lengthening the lifespan of Necrons past the age of 30. Some of these special Necrons that worshipped the Kitan would live into their 50s and 60s, and to the Necron, that would be like one of us living to 200. It is little surprise that many of the Necron society started to worship them, and this is when the Silent King began to notice something. For being all-powerful creatures in prisons, and woefully mentally inept, Gitan were highly coordinated, it seemed. Nothing he could prove or really put his finger on, but more and more of his people were coming to see them as gods. But it is the habit of living races to crave more power over the subjugated slave. So the Silent King proposed they need to form an alliance with the Kitan. With safeguards, of course. The council that was the head of the Necron Society took his offer under advisement. Now here we have to understand something. The Necrons were the masters of the Kitan, and they wanted to stay that way. So the Necron Council and the Silent King wrote up a contract for the Truthbringer to sign. This agreement took more than five years to finish for the Council and the King. This included things like adjusting the prison the Kintans inhabited, with even more locks and fail-safes in case they tried to escape. It included what the Necron scientists had touted as control collars on the Kintans so they could not disobey suggestions, all for the measly price of eventually attacking the old ones, of course. And for 20 years, these suits and collars worked flawlessly. The Kintans always came at the beck and call of any Necron master that was assigned to them. The Necrons themselves felt invulnerable to the Kitan, and the Necrons that worshipped the Kitan began to start worshipping the Necron lords that commanded them at their beck and call. Because who else could control a god except a mightier god? The Necrons felt superior to the Kitan and 1000% confident in their control. A new generation of Necrons had grown up with the Kitan being nothing more than loyal, subservient creatures to them. So when the Truthbringer proposed to this new generation that they could get rid of their ills, that they could get rid of their ills if they went to war with the old ones that year, this new generation wanted to prove itself and get revenge on their hated nemesis, so they were all eager to say yes. And why not? Gitan were a little more than dutiful, loyal slaves, having the mind of children that were easy to control and convince, of course. So it was agreed upon, and a great structure was erected in the temples of the Kitan. Long lines formed outside of them waiting to be transformed. The elite, of course, first into the temples. They were led down a long hallway that went away underground to a room, and when the door was shut behind them, only then did they realize their mistake. The king could feel something tore from him, even as his skin and bones were burned away and simultaneously replaced by something heavy, something cold. He emerged on the other side of the room into a long tunnel that still stretched out for miles underground. His feet clanged on the floor, though, and he noticed he no longer hurt. The door shut behind him, and there was another whoosh as the room lit up for the next Necron tier. As he walked toward the light, he realized he did so without fear without anger, without any emotion at all. It was then that he realized what he had done to his people. These Kitan, 
I tricked them. The Catan had bided them for almost 30 years to take all their souls and make them into the perfect slave army to fight against their nemesis, the Old Ones. Now, the rest of the story is well known, so we won't go into it here, except to point out one thing. In the end, the Necrons broke the Catan into shards so that they may imprison them into devices to harness their power. One shard even resides in the depths of Mars, locked up by the Emperor himself. But one has to ask, are the shards truly imprisoned, or does their power yet again use their wielders for some grander purpose that we have yet to see come to fruition? Well, thank you guys for listening. That is all I have for today for you. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and have a great day, everybody.